Mr. Ashton was correct when he said this is rare duct tape. This is, hasn't been sold since 2007 and was very lit, in very little quantities. You probably have never seen duct tape with a logo on it. It's always gray and silver. But you may recall when we, at shortly 10 seconds after playing this, uh, this video, George Anthony took the stand. And I asked him, where'd that duct tape come from? And his answer was, I don't know. There were a lot of people at the command center. Could have been anyone. He wouldn't even admit that that was his roll of duct tape. Completely denied it. He even denied the location of where this video was taken. But it was rare duct tape indeed, and it was also on a gas can that was found at the Anthony home that belonged to George Anthony. Welcome back, everybody. Continuing coverage of the Casey Anthony murder trial, and the day is not done. Her day in court continues. It will go into the night, and we will be here to cover it for you. Robert Schock joins me now. He is a former prosecutor and criminal defense attorney. Let's talk about the duct tape. Did the prosecution paint themselves into a corner here by declaring it a murder weapon? The prosecutor, Jeff Ashton, even visually showing how three pieces of tape were alleged to have been on Kaylee's face that suffocated her. Yes, they did paint themselves into a corner. They never had to say what the murder weapon was. And circumstantially, they would have been able to still build their case, make their arguments, and attempt to get their conviction. But by saying the duct tape was the murder weapon, they've now opened the door for Jose Baez to do exactly what he just did, to go in front of the jury, to use that video, to use that photo, to use that testimony to indicate that George Anthony lied about where that duct tape came from, and, and Jeff Ashton this morning said this is rare duct tape, it, it, that it's only 100,000 or so rolls were ever sold in the United States, and then to have George Anthony lie about it, it just makes no sense. And if the jury doesn't believe George, it may give the defense someone to point the finger at, and that's what they've subtly done throughout this whole case and well, what now, they subtly did on summation. And now they have... Cindy Anthony with her computer searches that were made not from home, but she was at work. Uh, you have George Anthony. They've hammered his credibility all along. And so what you're saying is the defense gained a little bit of an advantage potentially with what the prosecution did. Let me bring it back here. Kimberly, yes. on top of that, what does the defense do with the video? I want to show it to everyone. This was a presentation made early in the case. A lot of people said it was prejudicial. Let's show it. It's Casey Anthony, her, her well, remains. We're getting it now. Okay, her remains, which as they were describing where she was found and how she was found, they did a transition from her beautiful face with her mother looking on, smiling at each other, and then you saw what they claimed was duct tape over the baby's mouth. And there was a lot of sure. talk that that was prejudicial. It's very powerful evidence, isn't it, to put that in front of a jury. I think it's pushing the envelope too much. It was highly risky. I personally wouldn't have put it in. So in more any of the prejudicial than cases. probative. I opinion. think so. I'm surprised that there's a picture of it right there. I'm surprised the judge allowed this in because when you have a case that you can say is strong with circumstantial evidence, which has the same weight and effect as direct evidence, why would you take a chance and take an unnecessary risk with, by the way, something that might be offensive? and far too gruesome to some of the jurors. But it was Casey in there that they objected to primarily. The whole video, though, in particular, I think is objectionable, and I'm surprised the mm -hmm. judge even allowed it. The broader issue, though, of the duct tape, if it's conceded by the prosecution that it came from their home, if the defense is arguing that it came basically from the home and George lied about it, what does that do to this case? Because you have both sides of apparently in, in, in inferring that the murder weapon came from inside She had the access Anthony to the house. Home. If there was a murder but weapon. But she had access the to the house. She was in and out of the house on a daily basis. So I'd say, great, fabulous. She went and availed herself of every possible piece of thing that was in the house, whether it was a laundry bag, whether it was a plastic bag, whether it was the duct tape. That shows you. That connects her to it. I said, so what if George Anthony bought it? Casey Anthony used She may have had access, but the defendant would like you, or the defense would like you to believe that there was no murder weapon. It was an accidental drowning. Let's check back in the courtroom. The judge is back on the bench. We'll await the jury, and we will hear from the prosecution their final closing argument. This is the last thing that the jurors will hear before they get jury instructions and deliberate. And Joey, briefly, 
What do we expect to hear from the prosecution? I think what they have to do is they have to bring it back home and they have to say, this is not about attacking us. We're not attempting in any way, shape, or form to prejudice you against her. We're laying out the facts. Examine her conduct. Examine the science. Examine the circumstances. Everything points not to this grand conspiracy of us, not to present you with evidence and witnesses, but to give you the facts and those facts demonstrate guilt. Will they go list by list, point by point, and try to counterpoint what Jose Baez did? I think you sp address specific points, but you keep it in theories and you ultimately hit your point home with that as opposed to getting bogged down in too many details. Keep right. it simple. Let's listen in uh, Judge Perry. Some of you are doing fine and some of you are tired. I want all of you bright eyed and bushy tailed. Been a long day, uh, long day yesterday, and gonna be a long day tomorrow. Uh, we're close to the end. Again, I'm going to ask that you not to discuss uh, this case among yourselves, nor with anyone else. And we will see you where we will start at 8.30 tomorrow morning. Members of the jury, you're hereby excused. Well, there it is, the end of the day. For right now, the rebuttal will come tomorrow. The jury likely to get the case uh, uh, tomorrow after the prosecution rebuttal and after Judge Perry charges them with this case. It has been a long day, a fiery day, an emotionally searing day from both sides. Uh, as we now see the uh, court session has ended for the evening. But we're not ending no. because our all-star <laughs> panel is here. Yeah. And I asked you this question when this hour began, Joey. Deliberate defense strategy, perhaps, to put Chase, <laughs> Cheney Mason up after Jose Baez, even though their closing argument was complete, to have Cheney Mason take it to the end of the day so these jurors have one thing to think about, the last thing they heard, all defense. Jamie, if I had a hat on, I would tip it to you. Absolutely. Listen, if you do that, meaning you delay the case, you have a double closing, you have someone who pretty much regurgitates what you talked about earlier, brings in some new things with that fine chart that is a very effective, but what you end up doing is you have this as the last thing on their mind. So what now happens, Jamie? The jury now is out. They now go home, or not home, but back to their hotels, and they're thinking all night long about those effects effective points you made, so now when they come back in the morning, it's still first and foremost in their mind. But you know but what, if I'm the prosecutor mm -hmm. in this case, I had a big smile on my face because I said, you know what, this guy's going to love it. Ashton's been taking copious notes. Mm -hmm. to, he's going to go back and counterpoint, attack all of the things that they tried to do to poke holes in the prosecution's case. He has the benefit. I loved it when I got a chance to go and hit it hard Some in more the morning time to prepare. when they're fresh in the morning to do the rebuttal, especially in the homicide cases I would do, because you want to be the one, the last word that the jury hears while they're fresh, while they've had a good night's rest, their ears are open, their minds are alert. That's the way you want it. Then the judge instructs, and you take it to so him. So you think this is advantage I do. You didn't need I a whole I would love night. it. I didn't even, yeah, I didn't <laughs> you need You didn't need a night, night to go back and do night. this. You could do it right then and there. Yeah, but All it right. gives them time to <laughs> not leave anything out. All right, two different views. You know the uh, prosecution will be busy tonight as they try and rebut every <laughs> point of Jose Bias's uh, defense closing today. Phil Keating has been covering the case from the very beginning. He's been in the courtroom and at the courthouse. Phil, uh, a surprising sudden end to the day, but it's been a very long one. Yeah, inside the courtroom, you can see the jurors were looking pretty fatigued. It was a very, very long day. That was four solid hours of defense closing arguments, 77 minutes to start the day with uh, Jeff Ashton, the assistant prosecutor's uh, opening salvo of the prosecution's closing argument. They now get to rebut. They'll do that in the morning. They could have gone a two and a half more hours because the judge gave each side four hours for the closing arguments. So whether the prosecutors take the remaining two and a half hours they have allotted, uh, we'll see in the morning, though. Uh, it's going to start at 8.30 tomorrow morning. The defense or the prosecution the state of Florida will present its final uh, closing argument, and that will be the last the time that the jurors hear from these attorneys. After that, Judge Belvin Perry Jr. will read the jury instructions tomorrow morning. That should take roughly 30 minutes. And then this case will go to the jury. They will go into the deliberations room. And after being sequestered 100 miles away from home over in Clearwater, Florida, living in a hotel down here in downtown Orlando, and basically living and breathing the Casey Anthony first degree murder trial. They will then have the case to come up 
with all seven counts in the indictment. That's a first-degree murder, aggravated child abuse, aggravated manslaughter of a, of a child, as well as four counts of lying to investigators. Those are, she says she admits to lying to the investigators in the defense's case. Uh, th those were a given. Those will be convictions. Uh, the big question, though, uh, did Jose Baez today in his epic closing argument of his career, uh, did he raise enough reasonable doubt that this jury will acquit Casey Anthony of first degree murder and perhaps get give her a, los, a lesser offense or perhaps uh, an acquittal outright? There was a lot of evidence that Jose Baez pointed out that the state did not have. He actually had one uh, funny moment when he said, do you think this woman was so dumb that she left her dead kid in a bag 20 feet from the road, but so smart that she outsmarted the FBI crime lab in Quantico, Virginia. There was no DNA on the duct tape, and only one hair found in that trunk. There were no maggots in the trunk, just in the trash bag. There was no DNA on the paper towels in that trash bag. And there's no eyewitnesses to the crime at all. Very circumstantial case, but the state presented an ample amount of circumstantial evidence, including the chloroform searches and the partying and the lies, the lies.